Good afternoon, everyone. Just uh, waiting for a couple of people to join us. We will start fairly soon, though. Just a little bit of housekeeping for those that haven't used Teams before. Uh, you should have a little question and answer chat box on your screen, probably on the right hand side, although it does move around depending on your screen layout. Please feel free all the way through the event to interrupt with questions. Very happy to answer questions on the way through. Please type them in to the chat bot. It'll flash up and show me that there is a question. I'm happy to stop and answer those on the way through. There'll also be some time for questions right at the end of the presentation as well. Now, we are waiting for a couple more people, but let's get started anyway so we can get things moving um, and we'll begin shortly. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Craig West. I'm the CEO and founder of Succession Plus and today we're going to talk specifically about business succession and exit planning, some of the industry trends we've seen and some of the things that work particularly well for insurance broking businesses. So let's get into it and uh, we'll start with just a bit of a view around some of the key trends in the industry, what we're seeing with our client base and with people that we work with within the industry. Uh, and then we'll start to look at some specific information around succession and exit planning for insurance broking businesses and their owners, obviously. A couple of trends to start with. Um, this is a quote, and I do need to thank uh, both Macquarie Bank and Ibis World. You'll see there's quite a bit of data throughout this presentation, which specifically relates to information provided either in Macquarie Bank's very good benchmarking reports that they release every couple of years on industries and from Ibis World. So you'll see there's some specific information there. Um, obviously, we're in a very interesting time and we'd normally be doing this event face to face, um, but given the current pandemic, uh, we're streaming live. And I think it's an interesting thing to think about what that actually means for business owners. We've seen some business owners very badly caught out, uh, very unprepared for business continuity and risk management in terms of not being able to work from home or having significant IT issues and risks. So interesting just to see how that pans out. Uh, but certainly today, let's have a look at some of the industry trends and information so you can get a bit of an idea around what you should be thinking about as a business owner in this space and some of the things that you might be seeing that are also affecting your business and your business value. Obviously, it's a it's a very competitive industry. It always has been. Um, there's new competition. We see new players in the market with fintech startups and so on. We see other larger players like some of the grocery chains, for example, now starting to get into insurance generally. Um, that's changing distribution channels and patterns for brokers. Um, it's limited the growth as a result of that, but it's still opportunities. It's a very large industry, clearly. Um, about 13 billion in insurance broking uh, actually channels through that particular marketplace. The general insurance industry, of course, worth about $63 billion. So it's, it's substantial in any measure. Um, the growth figures, these are projections that are provided by IBIS World and they're always quite interesting to look at. They provide both the last five years growth. This is updated up to 2019. So the last five years growth at 1.3% and they're projecting growth going forward at 0.4%, so a little bit lower. Um, that's obviously independent of any effect that COVID-19 may well have uh, on that particular area. A bit of a profile of the industry. This is always interesting to look at just in terms of the number of operators in this particular industry. Quite stable actually, has been for quite some time, just around the 3000 mark um, in terms of businesses that are operating as brokers. It has declined gradually, but I think it's probably not uh, so much declining as much as consolidating. A lot of those declining numbers are not so much businesses closing or exiting, but businesses that are merging together or being acquired over that period of time. Obviously, some very large players in this space. Uh, most of you would be aware of those players and who they are and how they're operating. Um, there are some quite significant groups there. Uh, Steadfast, Ausbrokers, obviously, and Ipna being the largest three 
um, by a fair stretch. Just some numbers uh, for those of you that are interested or that haven't got access to this type of information. Um, by the way, I'm very happy to send you these slides after the presentation if you want information. This is also recorded, so we'll upload a recording of this information onto our website for later access uh, if you want to, or if you need to have a look at some of the information. It certainly shows you where the players are at, um, the gross commission, gross premium uh, that's been written over the last six years uh, by each of those three large players. And obviously statewide breakdown as well, which is not particularly important. It probably is fairly accurately representing um, the number of businesses in each of those areas. As I said, it fairly closely matches the uh, population distribution as well. Not, not too much variance there, a little bit low in New South Wales, a little bit higher in Queensland, but generally speaking, following the population trend pretty closely. In terms of the breakdown, obviously, um, the breakdown between life insurance, commercial general products, private and health insurance just shows you how that sector is broken down. Um, this is for the broken portion of the insurance industry. Uh, commercial versus private, obviously it's roughly 80-20, um, has been for quite some time now and that won't change, I wouldn't imagine, based on anything going forward. A couple of key external drivers, um, obviously the number of businesses, which as I said earlier has not really changed and is not really changing. Um, natural disasters. Now this this year, uh, 2020, we're right in the middle of probably the largest I've seen, certainly um, in terms of the pandemic with COVID-19, but we've just come off the back of both drought and flood and also very severe bushfires over the summer period. So natural disasters, clearly a driver of this particular business, um, as you can see. Profitability and structure. It's important to look at benchmarking. We benchmark all of the work we do with clients uh, to make sure we're seeing where they're over or underperforming uh, in those particular businesses. And that financial data is very useful. If you haven't had your business benchmarked, I would strong, strongly recommend you do that. It's an excellent first step just to see about, just to see where you're performing better than or worse than your competitors. Um, it's very competitive, as I said at the start, um, lots of different providers, but also lots of different offerings, funding options, product mixes, packaging um, and distribution. It's obviously quite different. So it's important to understand how that impacts the business. The growth opportunities, also quite important to understand. Um, lots of M&A activity in this market has been for at least 10 years. Um, I remember speaking at a conference for Ausbrokers in Cape Town in South Africa back in 2010, and we were starting to talk then about the dramatic increase in mergers and acquisitions. Well, that hasn't changed in that 10 year period. It's still going on. Obviously, we've got an aging population with baby boomers um, and that does have an impact on insurance as well, the demographics. Revenue forecast, not very exciting, I'm afraid, 0.4% over the next five years. Um, so it's a quite small growth, although obviously this, that number was um, calculated obviously prior to COVID-19. I'm not sure what exact change that will have. Um, I don't think anyone is at this point in time, but there will be an impact clearly. Uh, I think that's just a graphical representation of the numbers we've just been talking about over that period as well. In terms of supporting revenue growth, what is it that's going to drive revenue going forward? Obviously, increasing premiums, uh, increasing demand as people become more aware and more risk averse and more aware of the various risks that are happening to them right now um, and the ageing population, which again to, speaks to risk adversity, uh, will see increased revenue growth over that period. Um, negative impacts in terms of revenue growth, obviously direct sales. I mentioned that right at the start where you've got other competitors, including people like supermarket chains now coming into the insurance space and also changes in commission structures. So both of those will have an impact on revenue over a period of time. Uh, I want to speak now just briefly around succession and exit planning for insurance broking businesses. Uh, the research tells us this is not something that's very well handed, handled by the industry. Uh, I think the the strength and ongoing nature of the mergers and acquisitions in this particular industry is actually a trap. It often leads people, it's a little bit like the buyer of last resort clauses that exist in a lot of financial planning, uh, business licensee or dealer arrangements. Um, they're a trap because they basically give you an out. They give you a you know, buyer of last resort or the, you know, the option B or plan B. Um, there is always going to be a buyer for your business. However, 
um, to maximise value and achieve the exit the way you want to achieve it, rather than the buyer, does require some preparation. Um, obviously, we're based here. This is a, you know, it's not a revelation. This curve has been going on for some time. This is a baby boomer graph. It shows the number of baby boomers turning 65 in Australia per week. And you can see right now we're in 2020, it's roughly 5,000 people per week that are turning 65. Not all of them business owners, but some of them are. The interesting thing I think to note is this graph continues to grow. The number of people turning 65 continues to increase until 2029. And so this is not a short term cycle. This is a long term continuous wave and it continues to grow. It's actually getting bigger and bigger until 2029 when it starts to slow down again, but that's some 10 years off. So there's a lot of work to do going forward. Um, interestingly, this data is quite scary. Um, this talks about the fact that less than half of business owners successfully extract the value of their business upon retirement. And look, it's, it's important for most business owners to extract that value to fund retirement, at least partially. It may not be your entire retirement funding, hopefully it's not, but certainly it's a component of it. And what we know is that less than 50% actually successfully achieve that, largely because of very poor preparation. Um, about 35% of Australian businesses have any kind of succession plan in place. Um, in, in terms of insurance broking, according to Macquarie Bank's data, 35% either not sure or don't have a plan in place. So it's, it's still a reasonable number of businesses that are not well prepared and not well managed in terms of succession. Um, interestingly, we all tend to leave this too late. It's not something most people like to talk about. Um, it's inevitable and it will happen to every single one of us. You will all exit your business, as will I, at some point in the future. The trick is to do that on your terms, to plan that as early as you can. Um, I've never met anyone who regretted starting early. I've met lots that have regretted starting too late. So the message is to get in early and start to plan your succession and exit strategy. The key focus, you know, I talk about succession and exit strategy. A lot of people, I guess, don't understand exactly what I mean by that. What I do think that means is to get three things right all at the same time. Firstly, the business needs to be ready for a succession or exit event. Secondly, the financials, and that means both business financials and personal financials. So the business has to be ready financially to transition, and that could be a sale, it could be passing it on to family members, it could be an employee share plan, it could be a merger with a larger business. All of those things require financial preparation for both the business, but also for the owner themselves and maybe their family, other shareholders, etc. And lastly, the personal side people that are involved in these businesses, often the founder, often been in that business for 10, 15, 20 years, emotionally attached to the business and emotionally attached to ownership of that business. And so there is a significant body of work and thought that needs to be given to how we manage that exit or transition for the owner as well personally. If that person or individual or people uh, is not ready and is not well prepared, then traditionally the succession event will fail. How do we go about doing that? We've got a 21 step process that we walk through with all of our clients. As you can see, it's quite detailed. There are a large number of things to be done in order to prepare a business properly. But in our experience over the last 10 years, working with business owners, if you work through these 21 steps in the correct order over a period typically of about 18 months, you will always get a better outcome. You'll sell the business for a higher value. You'll have a more successful sale or transition. The business is far more likely to be successful after you exit, and you're far more likely to be uh, financially set up properly for retirement post sale or post exit or merger, etc. You'll see interestingly, a lot of these items on this 21 step process are not specifically done by us. Um, there's financial planning in there. There's certainly accounting and taxation work in there. There's legal documentation required, etc. It's a very collaborative space. So we're working with other advisors to deliver um, an exit and succession plan for insurance broking businesses across those 21 steps. As I said, typically takes at least 12 and probably more likely 18 months to implement properly. A couple of key considerations, a couple of key questions, I guess, to ask yourself as an owner. Um, when, you know, is the first question, what's the timing look like? Um, is it when you turn 65? Is it when your, you know, son who works in the business turns 30? Is it some other trigger event, um, a particular date? 
Uh, or is it some valuation number when the business gets to 10 million, then I'll exit or some other trigger. Um, the next question to think about is to start to think about what the options are. Are the employees capable of taking over? What's the financial status of the business? How easy would it be to hand over management control um, to other owners or to employees? And what are the future growth opportunities? And how easy is it going to be for you to get the terms of your exit right in terms of what the buyers uh, or incoming shareholders are actually looking for? First place to start is exit options. Um, once we've done a valuation of the business and assessment on what it's worth and what the most relevant and likely exit options are, then it's a matter of sitting down and having a look at this and really working out which is the most appropriate for you to exit. Obviously, bottom left hand side, family, friends and fools, uh, cheap, quick, easy, but not the best way to maximise value. As we go up and to the right, we're increasing the value of the business, we're increasing the likely price at which we'll sell or merge. Um, obviously, right in the top right hand side, um, an IPO. Not everyone has a business that is of a size that could IPO or list. Um, in the middle of that diagram, though, between probably partial sale and up to strategic sale are several options that will help you maximise value whilst providing you know, a reasonable level of complexity and effort. They're not simple, um, but it's a good model to balance those two factors to make sure you get the best possible result. Interestingly, um, in terms of Macquarie's benchmarking data, looking at the preferences nominated by business, uh, by business owners who owned uh, insurance broking businesses, looking just to see the difference between 2013 and 2016, obviously sale to key staff is actually increasing, um, which is market wide. That's not just insurance broking, that's across all professional service firms. Um, selling to another firm is reducing, close the doors, obviously not an option many people want to think about. Um, family succession is still around and hasn't changed a lot. So if you look at those options, um, you can certainly see sale, whether it's internal or external, um, is representing nearly a third, uh, nearly two thirds, sorry, of the marketplace. So that's certainly the preferred option, some sort of sale, either internally or externally, closely followed by family. Uh, passing the business on to our children or grandchildren or whatever it might be, uh, relatives in that particular position. So all of those uh, do require reasonable amounts of preparation and do take significant time. One of the most common errors that I see with business owners is they leave things simply till too late and try and rush things through. If I'm passing the business on to my family, that should only take a couple of months in legal documents. In fact, it should take several years. Um, there's a handover process, not just of ownership, which is actually fairly simple and quick to do, but more of the management and control of the business. How do we groom a successor to step into our shoes, take over the business and manage it successfully going forward? I just wanna talk a little bit about the employee share plan structure. It's becoming far more popular. We've now implemented maybe 12 or 15 of these particular models with business uh, owners who are in insurance broking, broking businesses. Um, typically, in professional service firms, including my own, but certainly in insurance broking firms, you would all have key staff who are in the business, who hold key relationships with clients and have done for some time and perhaps manage a team of people and a portfolio and you do not want them to leave. It is a very good option to consider passing some of the business ownership onto those employees over time, but it needs to be done in a structured manner. Um, a couple of key things just talking about employee ownerships, uh, whether we can sell internally or externally, as I said, the internal option uh, certainly provides you um, with an easier mechanism to retain key staff and to look at whether we can actually look at locking in those people with an equity stake in the business, which is far more likely to work than some kind of income bonus commission type structure. A couple of benefits of using an employee share plan. Um, firstly, funding. Generally speaking, there are several different ways that we can fund an employee share plan in an insurance broking business. Certainly employees can buy in um, and that's quite common and they can buy in gradually over time, which makes the funding easier for both the buyer coming in, the employee coming in, but also for the exiting partner. 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 Um, we're also able to borrow. Um, so we, we do work, I mentioned Macquarie Bank before, we do work closely with people like Macquarie Bank who will use um, and facilitate funding through an employee share plan for your staff to buy into the business. Um, that's obviously an option as well. And then we've also got profit share and bonus funded plans. Um, quite 
concessionally tax. So there are some taxation benefits to going down this road, both for the exiting owners and the incoming employees. Generally see improvements in financial and business performance, productivity, etc. Um, we're much more likely to see continuity of the business after the owner or founder exits. The existing employees taking over the business is a much smoother transition than selling it to an external third unknown party. And lastly, there's some tax concessions, as I said, it's a fairly tax effective transition of ownership using an employee share ownership plan within an insurance broking business. Um, I won't read through all of this, but it's very important to understand um, the alignment is important. What we're doing here is aligning employees with the business. Um, we generally see improvements uh, in both the business for the employee and also for the founder. I always describe these plans as a win-win-win scenario. The employee must be better off, the business owner or founder must be better off, and the business itself must be better off. If we don't do that, we haven't designed the plan very well at all. So it's quite important to understand exactly how that works. Um, obviously, we also get improvements in performance, in productivity, in client retention, et cetera. So there's some quite significant research and data behind the financial performance of employee share plans as a succession option. Um, this structure is one we've designed specifically to use in professional service firms. We've used it, as I said before, in at least 12 or 15, maybe insurance broking businesses over the years. Um, and it's proven to work quite well. We, the oldest plan um, using a peak performance trust, which is our own structure that we've designed, uh, the oldest one of these was set up in 2006. So they've been around for quite some time. They've obviously changed when the laws, particularly taxation, have changed, but the basic model and the premise behind why and how they work hasn't changed during that period of time. The underlying uh, design is mainly around getting employees to think and act like business owners, providing a structure some mechanism and rules to allow that to happen and to facilitate and manage that transition is exactly what these plans are all about. Generally, we use a profit share model to help fund uh, this particular business where a percentage of the improved profit is contributed to the funding model for the employee share plan. As I said before, employees can also buy in using their own resources. They could also borrow money and the company or the business could borrow money uh, through people like Macquarie Bank to help them fund the employee share plan acquisition as well. Obviously, it's an invitation. So we invite employees to join through a trust structure. There is a trust deed with rules that govern entry, valuation, exit, redemption, um, good lever, bad lever, drag along, tag along, all of those key things that are quite important. As we contribute um, to the employee share plan, the share plan has a restricted trust deed, which says that the only thing the plan can invest in is shares in the parent company. So it's a closed scenario where we're using the trust to buy equity in the business over a period of time. Uh, just a worked example to show you how that might particularly work. Uh, we've got John and Jane Smith as the founders or shareholders of this business, a company called Smith Trading. Um, let's assume in this example, it's an insurance broking business. On the top right hand side, we've sent some benchmarks. Uh, our profit benchmark is 500,000, below which nothing happens. So on a profit share plan, we don't generally start from dollar zero. We generally start from a profit benchmark. In this example, that's $500,000. Uh, our net profit in this example for that financial year was $600,000. And so we've got an excess above the benchmark of $100,000. 20% of that is $20,000. Down the bottom left hand side in step two, that physically gets paid from the business across to the employee share plan and then is used to buy 2% of the shares in the business. Now that cycle can happen over and over again, um, year on year, until either we reach a cap, we might cap the employee share ownership at say 10 or 20% and then we stop making those contributions. Or we might have a model where several of our clients have got a model where that just continues to happen along with both employee contributions in cash, which are not shown in this diagram and or external bank debt to accelerate the plan and have the employees gradually buy out the entire business over time. As I said, that model works fairly well. Um, there's some significant benefits in terms of taxation treatment but also in terms of the structure and rules that we can use to design the plan to make sure it matches the business outcomes you as the owner are looking for. Obviously, it's self-funding. We get some employee engagement improvements and generally we find that the bringing in minority shareholders without using a structure like this can be quite messy and troublesome. 
um, using a structure like this, we can design and manage the rules around entry, valuation, exit, dividends, etc. Um, I'm happy to open the floor up to questions and I'll just show you quickly a couple of resources we've uh, produced for you to use. But if there are any questions, I'm very happy to answer those now um, or separately at the end. I'll give you my contact details at the end if you'd rather uh, email me or contact me separately around those afterwards. OK, yeah, so the first question I've got here is a question around cost. Um, so a couple of things around cost. I think firstly, the employee share plan, typically it's a three month process. Uh, it starts with a valuation review of the business and an assessment mainly around the financial performance of the business to design the employee share plan to meet that criteria. Uh, month two is about education. So it's about informing both the owners and the employees around how the plan should work, what the key parameters are and what the design phase looks like in terms of rules. Thirdly, then there's just legal documentation and funding and setting up the actual legal structures. That process, as I said, typically three months. Um, there's some disbursements around legal costs and so on. Total cost should not be more than about $25,000 to set up a customised employee share plan um, for most businesses, certainly for professional services firms. Uh, any other questions? I'm happy to get, yeah, okay. Uh, OK, Mark, a uh, question around the size of the business that you need to have. Um, I would imagine for most businesses, insurance broking firms, you're going to have a reasonable number of staff. I have set several of these plans up with one person in mind where a broker or a business owner is looking just to lock in one key staff member. And so for 25 grand, I think that's reasonably economic to be able to lock that person in and retain them and build pretty much not a guarantee there's no such thing as a guaranteed succession plan but pretty much a predetermined mapped out and legally documented succession plan uh, so certainly you don't need to be a massive business to do this many of our clients turn over 10 15 million dollars but we've got several uh, including insurance broking businesses as i said that have done this just for one employee let me just go through a couple of resources i'm happy to answer any other questions that are around. Um, firstly, there is a specific white paper that we've written that goes through all of the research that we've covered today and a whole stack more, as well as a little bit more detail around succession options and specifically the employee share plan option. That's available on our website. It's free. You don't have to pay for it or anything. You just put your name in and it'll download it. It'll actually email the document to you. Um, it's quite detailed. It's about 20 pages long. There's a fair bit of information in there. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that if you haven't uh, seen that already. Um, I've also published a book on employee share plans, which is divided into three sections. Uh, firstly, just a bit of history and background into employee share plans, how and why they work, how long they've been used and some examples. Uh, some technical and tax information in the middle section, uh, particularly accounting and tax info around the tax treatment uh, of both the employee share plan and for employees, dividends, etc. And lastly, the academic research. I'm just completing now doctoral studies in using employee share plans for succession. And so I've included not all of, uh, but some of the academic research that I've done has been included in there around employee share plans and how and why they work. Uh, again, that's available on our website to download as an ebook, or you can buy it uh, in the iTunes bookstore or Amazon or anything else online. Uh, my contact details are on the screen. I understand some people may not want to ask questions in a public forum like this. I'm very happy to answer questions separately, either by email or simply ring me or text me on my mobile number there on your screen. Uh, if there are no other questions, I'm happy to finish things off. I do like to stick to time. I know people are very busy uh, in this environment, so please feel free to reach out for more information, either indirectly on the website or directly by contacting me. I hope that's been useful and helpful information and I uh, encourage you to look at your succession plan as early as you possibly can to make it the most successful option for you and your business and your family. Thanks for joining us and uh, I'm happy to answer questions later on if you want to contact me. Thanks again.